Good to be with you once again here at Midweek Manor. Get settled in. Get your sweet tea right there. Get your, uh, uh, you're not going to eat while I'm not eating, I hope. So just, just, just know that, that um, I have this ability to have discernment and, and I know what you're doing. So <laughs> now let's get, let's get into the study again of First John, and we're going to pick up at chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 1 and 2 again with John. Um, all I'd like to just reiterate, since each time we get, it's been, for most of you, it's been a week since you've had a thought toward this devotion. I mean, I know some of you have multiple devotionals that you're depending on. I hope all of you uh, join with the church for our daily um, devotions we send out which this year we're using A.W. Tozer. And again, if you have not done that on Constant Contact, um, you'll see that they are, um, if you have your cell phone, it just fills up your, your screen one time. So they're not in-depth. Um, I always try to put people before you that can speak to you knowing that we're all a little different, and I know that we all have time restraints, uh, someone like Tozer had such a brilliant mind and such a devotional life, prayer life that was evidenced uh, in his communications. Um, I wish I'd had the privilege uh, of sitting in a congregation with him, uh, at least as a guest speaker, if not a pastor. Uh, this man had just great, great, great depth to him. Um, and so I would say, without trying to <clears throat> use unusual words. I, I, I will say these devotions that he has, are con, they're uh, concise, and yet the word is pithy. They're full of substance. Um, when I have the adequate time, I will read that devotion, and then I will go back to it and just get still and grasp what he's saying because we're talking about the Word of God, number one. But I just love um, finding people of depth. How, how else can I say it? I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be prejudiced. I'm not trying to be biased. But our present culture is very intellectual, but very shallow. That's my insight. That's my view. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm hanging around the wrong people. But I just get weary with the shallowness. I get weary with just surface. It's killing us. I mean, you look at relationships people have, and, well, I, I thought he was this way. I thought she was this way. Well, what else did you think when you just got on an app and you read a profile that could have been, of course, embellished beyond degree, and you meet one time, and it's like, we have so much in common. Let's just uh, move in. What were you thinking? But that's the kind of stuff we hear constantly anymore. So let's not treat God this way. Let's get to know him. Let's take some time to get to know him through his word, through his presence, through other people that are walking in the light. Sounds like John, right? So with that, that's a good segue to get us right on into our reading today. So we're 1 John chapter 2. Verses 1 and 2, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Again, don't you just love language like this? My little children. This is um, this strikes us as that that sweet elderly uncle or somebody's grandfather that is one of your friends, and you get close enough to meet family members, and you meet their their grandfather. It's like, oh, 
I just want to hug him. I just want to hug her, the grandmother. What you can't feel here is that you just have a senile old man that's out of touch and out of circulation. He is speaking directly into the lives. I'm, I just had a situation here where um, I was giving instruction and looking at the longevity, it has its downside. It also has an upside. When you have taught, pastored, coached uh, a group of people for a long, long time, in my case, pastoring, knowing that um, I have been the lead pastor here, getting close to a quarter of a century. Plus, I had some years before that, uh, which was seven and a half years serving on staff with a five-year window in between the two times. When you take the amount of time I've been here, uh, combine the two times versus my natural age, half of my life has been in Marietta, Georgia, with this church. So because I can not only go back 24 years at this point um, as the lead pastor, I actually go back uh, to 30 years of knowledge uh, and more. Uh, going, of course, more toward the 35-year mark of when I met certain people that I still know today, or I knew their parents, or I knew their grandparents. Um, and when you see certain families that <clears throat> um, kind of are known for certain things, uh, you know their propensities, uh, you know their likes, their dislikes, their biases, their prejudice, their fun side, their weak side, on and on and on. Um, and that's what you got with John. <clears throat> and yet he takes the time. He has not become the grumpy old man who is like, I, I just, I just want to get out of Dodge. I, I don't want to deal with this stuff anymore. He's coming across with, with this uh, just sheer affection of genuine concern. Um, there's no doubt as he's writing these letters that he's writing to people he knows, not just about, and knowing that he is speaking to more than one generation um, through his letters and through, I'm sure, his daily communication or his responsibilities of however they structured their times of worship, studying Scripture together. So he comes in, and, and he just gets right to it and says, I'm writing to you so that you don't have to sin, knowing that it comes natural to us, knowing that it's easy to fall into and it's hard to get out of and that there is preventative maintenance. There is preventative medications that can keep you from going too far, of having those warning signs. I mean, I, the, the most natural um, graphic that goes through your mind is thinking of driving on an interstate, driving on a country road, driving in a, a city subdivision. It doesn't matter if 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 it has become uh, of current standards that we have known our whole life, you are beyond dirt and gravel. You have this asphalt and concrete, and you have lines drawn. And there's a uniformity to how wide a lane. Can you imagine driving on any road and the undulation of the of the road, uh, so you know it's six feet here, just enough to get my car through, and, and then over here it's ten feet or it's twelve feet. No, there's a uniformity. There's a standard to go by. Uh, and then, of course, when you have these different lines of demarcation, uh, and then you have them 
uh, of course, highlighted with different colorings, knowing that, oh, that's a double line there. I cannot enter that area. This one here, if I go past that, there's a little bit of grace, but beyond that, I can get in sheer trouble. I need to keep it between the lines. This is what John's doing for them. You don't have to sin. You don't have to sin. Again, my little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. And then he goes right on into, but if you do sin. So, again, he is being authentic. Uh, he is uh, just putting it where it is. I know in my own, if I can use the term career path, uh, I know in myself I want to come across authentic. I want to be authentic. I want to com communicate authentically. Uh, but for me, the compliments that m actually mean something to me, the substance is when someone that may be visiting, someone just getting to know me or knowing the church can say, man, I, I appreciate your candor. I appreciate your honesty. I appreciate you uh, saying it just how it is. Or, uh, man, you you really were speaking to me. And, of course, the other ones, it's like, okay, you had a microphone in our house, didn't you? Or you had the camera uh, in the house. Um, but keeping it real, right? Keeping it real. And this is what John is doing. And so we get to this, um, when you get into some of these deeper studies, and you will find individuals who are um, trying to refute the authenticity of the printed page, um, they may be agnostic, they may be atheist, they may call themselves a believer, however they are cutting and pasting, this is not acceptable, there's no way that this is authentic, so-and-so uh, uh, couldn't have written this, and of course all the scrutiny, which can be healthy and unhealthy, right? What we gotta remember is that Christianity is an ethical religion. Um, and we of course need it to be more than just ethical. You know, it's always that comment of what's the difference of an ethical man uh, and a moral man. Um, and you can see the, the depth that comes in with the morality um, of a situation. Ethics can be, I have, a, I, have an inf I have the information, I have knowledge of that. But with the morality, I need to be responsible to it. Uh, I need to understand that there's, there's judgment, that there's... Uh, you know, somebody's got to give an account. And so John's writing and, and reminding of that. And we as, uh, of course, sinners, how can, how can we ethically, uh, with an ethical religion, uh, uh, talk about sin knowing at the same time that there is a perfect holy God? How can the two meet and, of course, that's where we get into one way. That one way is Jesus Christ. Our times haven't changed too much from any other generation since uh, Jesus walked the earth of coming back to that, well, you Christians are just uh, intolerant. You're haters. You're bigoted. Uh, how can you say that Jesus is the only way? because he is the only way. And this is what John was communicating. I'm writing to you, my children. Please listen to me. You don't have to sin. However, if you do, as he worded it here, we have an advocate to the throne room. We have someone who will represent us, not just a public defender, not just an attorney. We have the Son of God. We have the one who was tempted in all points as we are, yet he did not sin. As he, again, would write here, he is Christ the righteous, who is the propitiation. That's a $100 word, isn't it? A propitiation for our sins. The replacement, the authentic, the validated, the only one 
that could atone for our sins because he was sinless and is sinless. And this amazing grace that we come in contact with that, oh my, we, we just can't dilute it. We can't water it down and just, okay, well, but pressure's on and can we accept some others that, no, no. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. He named him the righteous, who not only died for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. To understand again that this advocate is, from the original language written here, also we get the word comforter, the one who infuses us with strength, the one that can put in us the desire not to sin, the one that empowers us to say no to the temptation the allurement. Again, there's a craving that still comes from our being. I I want to do that again. I want to get involved in that again. I don't want to do this. And we need that inner strength that, again, we have as a believer through Jesus. The advocate, again, isn't the attorney. So I'm saying is more. He's the helper. We know that this uh, original word paraclete, parakletos, is a word described to God, period. The one who comes alongside. Yes, many times we're referring to the work of the Holy Spirit, the one who comes alongside. I am, um, I'm often making the comment because we just live in a vice filled world, and it sits on pews. And I will make statements. I made it again yesterday in a a phone conversation with somebody with a family member with a challenge and bringing up this this truth again of, of this work. And so I'll make a comment that provokes thought just to make you think, and I'll say, AA does church better than we do many times. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, I'm glad you asked. In the AA structure, in a structure, SA structure, any of these organizations designed to deal with this particular vice that has just gripped a soul and demands that it takes full control, you need to understand that Uh, the role of the individual of coming to a place of admitting, I'm a sinner. Yes, I've done this, I've done this, whatever the case is. And and, uh, that we realize in that that there has to be someone. Of course, the expression is higher power. And as Christians, a lot of times we get offended with that. And I'm not promoting it as a statement to be replacement to God or that there's many different uh, names that could be put in that one slot as a higher power. It's just a verbiage used because these organizations have to deal with the disease, the vice, the whatever. And so not to negate anybody, depending on whatever religious background they may or may not have, we're dealing with the subject of So they use the expression higher power. It's our responsibility as Christians to say, yeah, and that higher power has a name, and his name is Jesus. My point is, well, why would you say AA is better? Because in the program, as you go through 12 steps, the process is admitting, but also becoming accountable. And in that, then having individuals who are Paracletes come alongside. They sponsor you. Now, for the human paracletes, as I'm referring to right now, 
you know, what they have to understand is, you know, I, you don't need to be codependent. You don't need to depend on me. I am here to sponsor. I'm here to walk with you. I'm not your God. I'm not your knight in shining armor. You know, I'm not uh, any of these things that you may use a metaphor or analogy for. I'm just a friend, and I'm walking with you. And I'll I'll continue to walk with you. If you fall again, I'll I'll stand right there. I'm not going to pick you up. You got to pick yourself up. But if you get up and you're ready to walk again, I'll walk with you again. The beauty we have as believers, we don't have to sin. However, if we do sin, we have an advocate. We have one that comes alongside. Of course, the powerful thing is we got one on the inside interceding to the one above us. We have the full measure of God. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? So again, we come to this this counselor. Hebrews uh, chapter 7. Look at this. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Uh, Of course, you need to, we've studied Hebrews. Go back to it. But consequently, he's able to save us to the uttermost. I love that expression. He's not able just to save us to the uttermost. Those who draw near to God through him, Jesus, since he always lives, he's never, he's not dead, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The work of intercession that goes on. Again, for us, we don't believe in three gods. We believe in one God manifesting. God the Father, the judge, upon the throne, but seated next to him is Jesus Christ, the high priest of the heavenlies, the intercessor for us, pleading our case. When judgment has to come from the Father, Randy Brooks, you've sinned. You've fallen short of the glory of God. The judgment is death. Then Jesus being seated, next to the great judge, and says, I want you to see Randy through me, the lens. And when God the Father, the great judge, sees that I've been justified, not by my works, but through the work of justification, that Jesus purchased, and the Holy Spirit is at work in our life. Wow. Not self-justification, folks. Well, my mother dressed me funny when I was a kid. That's why I'm all messed up. Well, if you'd had the parents I had, well, if you had the siblings I had, or if you, on and on. No, the work of justification. To understand again what John is saying. My little children, I love you. Whatever age you are, I love you. And please, I get it. We don't have to sin. That doesn't mean we justify, well, I don't sin. I just make mistakes. Everybody else sins. No, no, no. And if we do sin, we have an advocate. I am... I had a dear friend, I refer to him every once in a while, pastor's son, killed in a plane crash with his father and his brother back in the 70s, 1977 to be exact, and a very gifted songwriter, and I don't say that uh, conservatively. He uh, had uh, music that made it to word recording and music that uh, won won double warts. And uh, of the songs... The one that just never, ever goes on a date. And everybody, if they hear it, it's like, oh, my gosh. Is he never gave up on me. He never gave up on me, though for myself there's no hope I could see. Goes on that, man, he doesn't give up on us. It's because, again, that same love that John's writing with, my dear children, 
is coming from the Father, coming through the Son, coming through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Um, this propitiation, I, I actually wrote this down again. The word, um, halasmos, H-I-L-A-S-M-O-S. Uh, of course, it's more natural to the Jewish mind, but it's it's a sacrifice. And and again, we, we, we're back to this statement. How can, if it's an ethical religion, how can someone in sin go to a holy, perfect God? It is through all of this system of the propitiation. I was going to go on and and uh, go to some more verses, but I'm, I'm going to close out with this. I just feel prompted to do this. As believers, I, 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 there's another great song in my head. Andre Crouch wrote it. Yeah, take me back. Take me back. Take me back. Take me back to the place I first believed. There's privileges of growing in grace, maturing in grace. And if we're growing at a good rate <clears throat> and maturing, then we should never lose sight of how much grace has afforded us. <clears throat> However, if we don't keep fellowship and walk in the light as he is in the light, again, this is all words we've already read from John's letter here, we can become indifferent. We can get lax. We can get cold. We can assume all these things that causes us to get barnacles on us, to get cobwebs in our relationship, that causes us to lose a step, to erode. We can go on and on and on with the analogies. To come back to this place, to always keep in view, I, I'll, I'll give another visual. The synagogues around the world are positioned to face toward Jerusalem. The synagogues were created to be community centers that dealt with all aspects of life in the kibbutz. And yet, when you go into the synagogue, you have the seat of Moses, and you have, of course, the Word of God. You have the Tanakh. You have the law, the Torah. And depending on wherever Jerusalem is, the building is positioned that way. And as you come in the doors, you, you come past what I just described, and then you're seated facing Jerusalem so that when the Word of God is being read and spoken, that you are hearing it and seeing it. Man, this is beautiful. We as well, we get busy. We get, we get overwhelmed at times to keep grasp of how John's writing, my, my children, you don't, you, don't, you don't have to get out of a loving relationship. You don't have to be, well, I've been serving the Lord 60 years. You know, I, when I grew up, I put away childish things. And no, keep that tenderness, that childlikeness. And to understand if, if, if we just keep not only him, but the reality that he's the propitiation. He, he paid the price for my sin. How can you ever become ungrateful? How can you ever become indifferent? When that is a new and a fresh revelation every morning, just like mercy's a new every morning, once again, I'm reminded. I, I shared this, and I'll, I'll share it and close out. Since I've had the hearing aids, <laughs> at times it, it still captures what I was missing. Uh, and I wasn't missing everything. Um, and... Um, just certain pitches, whatever. Um, but I, I've seen a difference in myself. When I park that truck in the mornings to, before I get on that big yellow bus, um, here I am in a, in a metro area. Here I am 
caught in between buildings and a lot of vehicles. And yet there's just a little tree line right there. Uh, I don't mind telling you where it is. It's, it's uh, right behind us is, is uh, the backside of Sam's Club and all them big trucks going in out of there bringing supplies. And now, before it gets my nose, I'm already open my truck door to hear the birds singing that early in the morning, trying to cause me to, again, this is the day the Lord has given me. I'm going to rejoice in it, and I'm going to be glad. And all the many blessings, Lord, please help me to keep striving to keep a grateful tone instead of just, well, in the moment I'm upset or in the moment I didn't get my way or in the moment I'm showing my selfish nature again. Cause me, Lord, to, to smell the roses as I go by. Don't just get so busy with everything else I didn't even see them, much less smell them. So we'll, we'll close out this time with that thought. Just again, let's keep sight that he, ne- he never gave up on us, and he's still not giving up on us. And he's, he is constantly making intercession for us. We thank you for, again, your word. We've just camped out in one, one pivotal point today. But, oh, my, how rich and uh, how needed. So as we, again, think upon your goodness, all you've done for us, and what you have prepared. You have saved us to the uttermost. We give you thanks today. With grateful heart, we bless your holy name. We barack you. We call out the name of the Lord and just shout in your presence how good you are and give you thanks for all you've done and all you're doing. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Until next time, God bless.